Okay, good afternoon. Um, so today and on Friday, we'll carry on looking at topic, uh, personal identity article. And after that, we'll be through on personal identity. And we'll move on to looking questions about free will and agency. Um, I hope you've been able to look at the Parker article. Have you looked at the Parker article? Some of you, yeah. Uh, uh, I think, is this right? I, I think most people's experience of it is that there's one level in which it's an extremely clear article that as you read it sentence by sentence, every little bit you zoom in on is absolutely clear what he's saying. But it's kind of like pop art in that um, everything you look at, yeah, you know what that is. But then you step back and say, but what is going on here? And you think, well, I, I really do not know what, this is, what the genre is here, what, what, what all this is about. So what I want to do is start out with um, one way of thinking of what he's up to in the article, give a kind of model for what he's trying to do. And I think a way to think of it is that it's a kind of critique of self-interest. And the um, interesting and original thing that he's doing is what kind of critique of self-interest it is. I mean. Um, any preacher, any person can tell you that you ought not to be so selfish, that uh, we all sort of focus too much on ourselves and so on. Um, that's a kind of easy thing to say, an easy thing for anyone to say, and it usually carries very little weight. Uh, the reason it carries very little weight is that self-interest is just so central to our ordinary concerns, and that if you think about the concern to survive, the concern that you should make it, that's um, so fundamental, so deep in all of us, that the idea that you should think of your own life as one among many is so alien that it's not really imaginable that a human, an ordinary human, could take up that kind of stance. Uh, the question is, how can we still keep anything like our ordinary motivations um, while having any kind of critique of self-interest? Because self-interest is so key to everything we do. I mean, it's key because just the most elementary kind of responsibility is you have a kind of responsibility for your own life that you usually don't have for anyone else's. So much of what you're responsible for, that we ordinarily take people to be responsible for, is their own life. Um, so of course we've got to have people looking out for themselves. Um, but you can make a distinction here between two kinds of critique of something that we value in our society. One is sort of a radical attack. A radical attack is something that comes like from Mars, that comes from outside the way that humans usually live and the things that we ordinarily care about and says, um, we are not to have anything to do with uh, self-interest. My death, that's not any more important than anyone else's. We should all think like that. That's so alien that it's hard to know how you could go about taking up that attitude. But Parfit's critique here is quite different. He's saying, um, let's not directly criticize self-interest. Let's say, what is it that you're concerned about when you're concerned about yourself? What's the content of self-interest? And I'm trying to think of an analogy, and um, here's what I think might be an analogy. Suppose you live in some humble village um, well, the baptism of a child is a big thing. It's greeted with a lot of ceremony, um, a lot of costs. Uh, so the elders have to be present, and the newborn is named, and in this elaborate ceremony, initiated into the village. And let's suppose it's not a religious practice. Let's suppose it's not that some holy book tells you this is what you do with newborn. It's just this is the way it has always been in the village. Well, suppose that you are a young radical free thinker in the village, and you want to critique the ancient ceremony. How would you go about it? Well, one kind of critique would be to say, this whole business of the way we treat newborn children is a lot of nonsense. The radical critique says, this whole business of parenting is suspect. We should be growing the children in test tubes, um, growing them optimally in test tubes, and sending them off into the desert in order to make sure that only the tough survive. Weed out the feeble. That's my approach to parenting. Um, and if that's your take, right, if that's your radical critique, well, baptism, <laughs> baptism has no place, right? I mean, we're not going to take the test tubes into the fountain and all that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, uh, that would be a radical critique that says, the whole way you think about this stuff from start to finish is a mistake. That's the analogy of saying, forget about self-interest altogether. Just do it from scratch and say that everyone counts for the same as everyone else. You can make that case, it might be very cleverly argued. It will have no uptake because it has no connect to our ordinary motivations. You're trying to critique the practice from this detached perspective that just leaves behind ordinary human emotions, ordinary human concerns. But another thing you could do if you're a free thinker wanting to review the baptism ceremony is you could say, why is it that we care about the baptism ceremony? Why do we do this? What's the point of it? What are we up to when we do this? You could say, well, really when you think about what we value here is not the ceremony itself. It's the celebration of the birth of the child, including the child in our community. These things are what really matter. And when you pinpoint what it is that we actually care about, you see that the actual ceremony is neither here nor there. The ceremony is actually irrelevant. The important things are these things to do with the community. So that way of critiquing it isn't to say, let's start from scratch. It says, let's keep in place the structure of the concerns that we already have, but try and pinpoint just what we do care about and what we don't. Try and identify what would really uh, matter for our concerns and what doesn't. And the trouble with a radical critique is, suppose you do marry, suppose you're just pure spirit, you're just really not in um, uh, uh, ordinary space so far as your motivations go, um, and you reach some detached perspective from which everyone counts for the same as everyone else, parenting is of no particular value, um, children are of no particular value, then if you reach that perspective, then what do you care about anything? And you have no idea how to go about uh, uh, evaluating positively or negatively any proposal about how to live. So a radical critique of self-interest, a radical attack of self-interest that just leaves behind the ordinary emotions, it also, if you move far enough into outer space where you're criticizing what people do, all you find is that you don't have a standpoint from which to evaluate, to justify or criticize what actually is going on. Parfit's saying, don't directly challenge self-interest. Just ask, what is it you're concerned about when you're concerned about yourself? <coughs> the question is, what are the concerns that drive us? If you're concerned about your own death, just to take the simplest, most dramatic example of self-interest, where you say, if I, I mean, I promise you if I say, um, just for the sake of, uh, uh, just for the pedagogical value of the thing, at the end of this class, we always kill one student, um, just to shatter up the rest. Um, and what is the first question? Why is the guy in jail? No, <laughs> the first question is, is it going to be me? I hope it's not me, right? That's all. There is some generation thing here. You, you would naturally think, well, I hope it's not me, right? If you're told, we're going to take just one and shoot you. 
yeah? It'll be technically so valuable. Is there a case there? Well, it's expanding. It only has a first year. It's not a bad idea. But anyway, uh, right. If you try to take up a perspective what you say, with that kind of question, but will it be me? That gets no traction. I don't care about that. Everyone counts for one. No one counts for more than one. That's a position that's so alien to our uh, uh, motivation that we can't um, uh, find a, some way of thinking about the world that would be of any, uh, uh, that could connect to our understanding of what's practically significant and what isn't. Um, so instead, we're just going to say, what is it that I'm concerned about when I say, but will it be me? What's really driving this? Okay, so so much for just what I think the genre is of what Bartlett's doing. Is that plain to say? Is, uh, what, what that kind of contrast is? It'll probably make, come into focus more what, what, when, I look at, when you look at the example. So, <coughs> when Bartlett's talking about fishing, or as uh, someone talked about it earlier in the class, people talked about this earlier, printing off, you can just print off people, print off copies of the original captain. Then, uh, the reason for thinking about this is to help us pinpoint what really matters to us about ordinary survival. Just as in the baptism case, you could say, well, imagine if we did it this way, imagine we did it outside the usual structures, what would we get then? That's a kind of thought experiment where you could say, would I still be getting everything I care about in the original ceremony? If you think about printing off people fissioning, would I still get what I really care about in ordinary survival? Well, if you're talking about the fission, there's going to be psychological continuity along each branch of the fission. What I mean is, the memories that are, that are there along each branch of the fission will all causally depend on what came earlier. But as someone said last time, the offshoot in that fission case um, is not identical to each other because there are three people there, not one. Um, and this was, uh, yeah, this is a good question. They can't all be identical to the original because the original is only one captain, not three people. Um, so they can't, uh, 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 they can't all be um, identical to each other because there are clearly three. Wait a minute, let me just. They can't all be identical to each other at the end because there are clearly really three. Uh, they can't all be identical to the original because if they were all identical to the original, they'd be identical to each other. And there's no basis for saying that one of them rather than any of the others is identical to the original. Therefore, the original ceased to exist. Right? I think we talked about that last time, was that plain to say? Any questions about that? So you have that connectedness, that causal connection up each branch, but you don't have identity with the original. The great philosopher David Lewis argued the other way. He said, that's not true. You can think of a person as a set of person stages, that is to say, thin time slices of a person, and you can consider the set of slices that go up the right limb and down to include the base, up the middle limb and down to include the base, and up the left limb and down to include the base. These are three different sets. Yes? Are there any mathematicians here? These are different sets, right? Yes? Kind of like development stages, yeah. What I mean is like five minute stages, yeah. So since I came into the room, there was a five minute stage when I set up the projector, there was a five minute stage when I started talking, then, uh, yeah. Or here, there was a five minute stage when you looked at your feet, five minute, you, you see what I mean? Five minute stage when you got set up, uh, five minute stage when you got five bodies up in the race again, um, that, that kind of thing, yeah. So you're always stages, right? That's all the stages, yeah. So then you just vision, yeah. And so the stages up here, and stages up here, yes. That's all right. Follow me very closely here. If you think in terms of a person as a collection of stages like this, all these stages are causally connected to one another, right? This is causing that one, 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 yeah. Yes, they're all causally connected. If you think of it like that, what's a person? A person is a set of person stages, yes? But is any whole set of person stages a person? If you took just one five minute stage, would that be a person? No, that is too small. That is just a part of a person. You see what I mean? That is just a bit of a person. Otherwise, um, as you and I are talking right now, all these people will be coming into existence and going out of existence, and that is not what's happening, I think. Yes? Uh, yep. Yeah, there'll be different stages up here. Yeah, the, yeah the, 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 these things will be physically distinct from these things. Yeah. yeah. Um, so then if you, what you want for a person to be is for a person to be of a big set of person stages. You'd want a person to be the biggest set of person stages um, uh, that constitutes a person. So if you just took this here, that wouldn't be a person because it's a bit left out. Yeah. So if you took this, that would be a person. That would be a total set of person stages, a maximal set of person stages. That's all right? So that's one set of person stages, that's one maximal set of person stages. Does that make sense? Put your hand up if that makes sense. Very good. Okay, well, if that makes sense, then what about this? I say this too is a person. That's another maximal set of person stages. Yes? Okay, and they kind of overlap. But they're different because they're different total sets. They have different members at the top here. Yep, yep. These are not options, these are not possibilities. That's what I meant about the science fiction thing about walking through different ways at once. Yep. Uh, so it's like that. These are two actual people who are different actual people who are here at the, at the end of it. Yep. Okay. So, uh, and I said you this might medically happen and you might be told. Well, it's since Chernobyl it happens more and more often that people fission. Yep. Okay. So this is person, this is one person, this is a different person, this is left over here. Uh, and this is right here. So suppose this is you, right? And, this, and, and you're told in a year you're going to fission. Then a year there'll be this set of person stages over here, that set of person stages over there. So how many person in your suit right now then, how many people are there? One? That is the wrong answer. There's two. Because look, what's in your suit right now is just this intersection bit. Yeah? That's a member of both sets. So on this analysis, there are actually two people sitting in your chair right now. Yes? There could be a million. I mean, if vision really, if we, uh, yeah, if vision happens often, you can kind of rule off of vision. Every year, twice as many, you get twice as many vision products as you did the previous year. Yeah, in a few years, you'll have a million. Yep. Yes? Ah, uh, ah. Uh, um, well, I guess he does. Yeah, I guess he has to. Yeah, it's a bit of a person. Yeah. I kind of goes round and round. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's right. That's a real problem. Is, is that more basic than the notion of a person? Yeah. That's a, a, a basic puzzle. Yeah. Sorry? Oh, very good. Yes, that's a question. Yeah. Right? Very good. Yes. That's right. Yep. Yep. The original had to exist. There would be four people sitting in your chair. Yep. And if left here is the same, it would be, wait a minute, I think it would be like one, two, no, it would be three. If left here is the same, uh, one, two, three. Yep. Uh, well, there's, there's right two, one, and right two, two. Well, actually, um, yeah, there's right two, one, and right two, two. These are two different total sets. Yep. <laughs> 
this is not a possible view. And this is, <laughs> the, yeah, as you often with professor Lewis's views, the um, reaction that is, is generally being reasonably considerable, but I'm sorry. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, you haven't read yet, yes, right, right. You're still on the bottom, but the point is that attachment is a maximal set of attachment stages. Uh, but the maximum, I mean, the, the maximum reaches all the way to your death, to death, yeah. Yeah, that's a person from proxy death. The maximal set of attachment stages. Yeah, so you can death up here, not here, not here. So you can see different people altering the same field at the same time. Anyway, I just mentioned that as, um, as, as, as a view to write down the fact that if you, if you, um, <coughs> if you didn't like the idea that in this kind of scenario, the original person has ceased to exist, then a way of getting um, out of that would be to say, no, the original person has, uh, is still continuing to exist because there were, in fact, three people there all along. You see what I mean? So that beats the logic of uh, that kind of argument. The argument there was they can't all be identical to each other, um, therefore they can't all be identical to the original because identical to the original would be identical to each other. But if there were actually three people there in the first place, um, then uh, you can see that that works. Yes? Is he against this argument? Yeah. So that's right, these three all continue to exist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think this is generally possible equation too. Uh, I don't know if that's an argument. That was Lewis's point actually. I think thinking of this equation view is not an argument against that position, but um, you haven't really understood it unless you think of this equation view. Uh, okay. <laughs> but anyway, I, I mean that just as a kind of exercise. The important thing here is, what's the definition of identity? If we got this far, we've got it that identity has something to do with psychological continuity. That in this case of um, the prince and the cobbler, then the natural idea was that if there's psychological continuity between the earlier prince and the later cobbler, then you say the prince has moved body. And uh, a couple of sessions ago, I said, well, you can define this. You can say, um, uh, you can define it in terms of quasi memory. You can say that the later person is identical to the earlier person if the overwhelming majority of the later person's memory impressions causally derive from what the earlier person saw and did. Yes, we remember that all that stuff on brain size and so on. Yes? Okay. Um, but the thing is that in these fusion scenarios, you've got that across all three branches. That the later memories are caused, the overwhelming majority of the later person's memories are caused by what the original person saw and did of all three branches, and you still haven't got identity by this argument. Yeah. So what's going wrong? You've got branching. So um, identity is when you have psychological continuity without branching. That's the definition. You just get to reach that because you end up pointing in the discussion. Yeah. So what you can say is the later person is identical to the earlier person if the overwhelming majority of the later person's memory impressions are caused in the right kind of way by what the earlier person saw and did. And there wasn't any branching. If there was branching, then you don't have identity. If there wasn't branching, then you do have identity. So you've had that, that just seems, I hope this seems pretty straightforward at this point. Does that seem perfectly straightforward? Does that seem pretty puzzling? If you got off the bus a long time ago. Um, okay. Um, so you can say that generally we're talking about the identity of uh, a lexon or the identity of a stool. You can say what makes the stool the same uh, concrete object as the stool earlier is that there's a causal connection between the way the stool was earlier and the way the stool was now. But then you've got to add, and there isn't any branching. If the stool branched, then it wouldn't have been the same thing, even if there was causal connection. So even if you say same as to the person is same as to the body, you've got to have in that condition about there not being branching. If you're a body that branched, you have lost identity. Uh, yes? Yep. <coughs> that wouldn't be branching. Well, it, it wouldn't be psychological branching because there's only one psychological light there going all the way through. Yep. Uh, I've just given you a case where, um, like this one, if I remember Sumi would have given a case where the brain moves from one body into another. Is that right? Yeah. Yes, right. So that's not a case where there's branching. Uh, for the original person splits into two or more. There's no reason to say that one rather than the other is the one that's identical to the original. Yeah, but that's not what you got here. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. No, that would not be branching. Uh, that's right. Right. The, the, the way you just described it. Um, uh, there's a single body going all the way through. Yeah. Uh, uh, so if I think about that case in terms of the identity of the person is the identity of the body. There's only one body here, yeah. right? At no point did that branch into two different bodies. Yeah. There are two bodies, yeah. Right. Right. Well, it's not branching. It's not branching physically.